Father, thank you so much. Thank you for being you. Lord, help us to set aside the, the troubles of the day, the troubles of the week, the troubles of the year. We come to you for new renewing.
Is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come? With all creation I sing praise to praise.
tried turning it on and tried turning it off and back and forth. It's okay. We talked about, hey, it's so good to see you, by the way. Thank you for being here today. I just want to welcome you. Some of you have joined us, oh, about 11 o'clock or so, or whenever you started this video, and uh, about 24, 25 minutes ago. Hope that you've enjoyed this time of extended worship, praise. I don't know about you, but when I come to church, I want more than just good music or good singing. I want to experience God. And I believe that's just happened for some of us. You have to enter in. God's presence is real because God is real. God is alive. God is not some imaginary thought or an idea, but God is real. I was listening to some people talk about creation this week and Genesis and, you know, the Big Bang Theory and all these things. And the amazing thing is that God is so incredible that, and someday we'll, we'll probably do a teaching on this. I, I want to anyhow. But we can't even imagine exactly who or what God is. See, this, so this is our trouble. Because let's say that God did, that the universe was started with a big, big bang, okay? Then whoever started this thing out with this clump of whatever, okay, this matter, had to be outside of nature itself to be able to activate that and make it bang, Okay, are you following me? Because that's all nature. That's all science. That's all everything within the realm of what we understand. But something outside had to start this because that's the way things are. There always has to be an outside activator to something. So it didn't just decide or just all of a sudden it was time for it to do that. Something caused that matter to begin. And I'm not a scientist, so if you're watching this and you're going, He's a complete fool. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about on science and biology and geology and all these things. Not like you might, but I can tell you this, that God is outside of the realm of nature. We know that. And so trying to understand him and un understand his ways are sometimes very difficult. And we do the best that we can because what we have is his word. And so his word doesn't give us the answer to every single question that you might have in life. It may not explain every single thing that you want explained to you. But what it will do is point to God's ways. And it'll say, this is the way God is, okay? And you know what you find when you begin to, and this isn't in my notes, so this is totally free, all right? This is not on demand. This is one of those previews to something else I'll speak on some other time. But what you will find out when you begin to study the word and God's ways is that he is love and that he loves you. So this must be for somebody today. I spoke with a gentleman that at work this week who's, I said, you're a seeker, man. He goes, I think I'm an agnostic. I said, no, I don't think so. I think you're a, a seeker think you're seeking something. And I said, you need to quit circling the airport and land this baby. Because you're all around. You're asking every question about God. I said, when are you just going to give it a try? When are you just going to go for it? What do you got to lose? And you know what? I, I, I said to him, here's what you need to know is that God is like a lover. God is a lover who's seeking those that he loves. And he's relentless. He never gives up. He, think of a, a, of a high school boy who gets infatuated. Just think of Warren over here, but we won't go there, okay? But just think of a high school boy who gets infatuated with that pretty young thing at, at, at school. And everything, he can't quit thinking about her. He, can't quit. he, is, he pursues her relentlessly. Because he's in love. And we can't, that's the best that we can do. That's the best we can do when we think about God. Because 
we can turn our back on God, and God still loves us. When the girl throws the ring back at you, you usually just, we'll go try another one, okay? And we dust ourselves off. God doesn't do that. He goes, no, you're the one I want. And he's after you, okay? He's after you. So I don't know who this is for. This is for somebody today. That was free, all right? But God loves you that much. He is your spiritual lover, and he will not give up on you. All right, so let's get into this, because I want to talk about the book of Ezra for the next five weeks. Woo, I heard the excitement out there. Well, it is exciting. And if you haven't dug in, see, Ezra and Nehemiah are two different Old Testament books, but they used to be one. They used to be combined long before you were ever thought of, okay, or me. And um, so it's kind of like part one, part two. So we're going to deal with part one, which is the book of Ezra. And at a wedding um, a week ago, we uh, there was a song played. And um, I had heard this song many times, but until you sing a song and you get involved with it, it begins, and I think that's the importance of coming together and singing, by the way. I think something happens when you begin to personalize these things. And there's a song called Graves into Gardens, okay? And um, I know some of the people, I don't know them personally, but I know some of the people, there's like four different people that wrote this. And um, it says this, you turn mourning to dancing, you give beauty for ashes, you turn shame into glory, you're the only one who can. So you know what that is? That spells out H-O-P-E, hope. That spells out hope for you and for me and anyone else, okay? Because the people of God in the book of Ezra, they needed hope. At this time in their existence, they needed hope. So this is a five-week series that's going to address what God did for the Jewish people throughout the events that were recorded in the book of Ezra. And Ezra means Yahweh helps. Say that. Yahweh helps. Who's Yahweh? God. Right. Thank you. So Yahweh helps is what Ezra means. So I started to tell you who I was. I'm Larry Knoll, and this is the light in Kent. And uh, we're in Kent, Ohio at 1417 South Water Street between Domino's and Dairy Queen. And I got going down a different road a minute ago, but I wanted to come back to that just so if you're watching and you found us on YouTube or something, you go, what in the world am I watching? Who is this person speaking? All right? That's not as important as what we're going to talk about here. So the theme of the book of Ezra is three things, return, restore, and repentance. Return, restore, and repentance. So here's what happens, I believe, in our life. At least what I've seen, what I've experienced is that because we fail, because we go through things in our life that we feel are failure, um, not monetary failure so much, not uh, in the way of personal success, but in the way of failure um, morally, spiritually in those areas, okay, which I think are more severe than the other that I mentioned, we forget what's important in our life and we sin. We begin to do things that God considers as sin, okay? So through that, we begin to separate ourselves from God, which is very, you know, God is after us. He's pursuing us, but we start stiff-arming stiff him like this. No thanks. You know, I need some space, God. And the more space that we get, the more guilty we begin to feel because of that, because God keeps loving us and we keep pushing away until we become an exile. For one reason or another, something takes us to a place where we're no longer in God's presence on a daily basis. He's still seeking us. He's still after us. He knows right where we're at. When I say seeking, he's seeking our love. He knows where we're at. And we're trying to forget God. We're trying to have a nice life without God. But just as in the book of Ezra, God reclaimed his people. God reclaimed his people because he promised to do so. He promised them, I will get you back, and I'll get you back to where you belong. He also reclaims and redeems 
your life and my life, okay? He does that because he has a purpose for our life. He has a purpose for us. And we don't even realize. And you, you're sitting here going, probably not. Not my life. You don't know my life. Mm-hmm. Just stay tuned because next week we'll deal with that one, how God uses unlikely people, people that would think I could never be used by God. God, you know, I'm, not, I'm one of the exceptions. You're the ones that God likes to use the most. Oh, so stay tuned. So I don't know, have you ever heard that old commercial, Motel 6, by Tom Bodette? It says, we'll leave the light on for you. I love that. They don't play it much anymore. But see, God's always leaving the light on for us to be able to find our way back. He's always leaving the light on. He never turns it out and says, well, forget about it. When You know, when we have people come over and it's in the evening, we turn the light on. Why? Because all of our condos look the same. And they need to be able to see my little car so they know which house it is, okay, and the number. But I'm helping them find a way because all those condos, even though they're slightly different color, like some of my friends have have, I won't mention their names, they've gone up to the wrong house and sat in the driveway waiting for me to come out to pick me up for men's breakfast. So, but we won't mention who that is. God has a purpose for our lives, and he cares so much about you that he leaves the light on for you, okay? So have you ever felt like your life's been hijacked? How did I end up here? How did I end up on the Jerry Springer show, I said one time? I actually talked to Jerry Springer once on the telephone. I called into his radio show, and I talked to this guy. And he's a different person on the radio than he is on TV, by the way, okay? But anyhow, there was a point in my life, th the most ridiculous things happened to me. It was so out of character for my life that I actually said, how did I end up on the Jerry Springer show? Who has hijacked my life? How did I get in this strange place with strange circumstances? And I don't even recognize the people that are around me. What's going on? Maybe your old friends are distant now. You don't even know where they're at, what they're doing, what they're thinking, what they're saying, what's going on with them. You see it on Facebook, maybe, if you check in there. Have you ever seen somebody that you used to spend holidays with and you're apart from them now and then you see Christmas pictures on Facebook and you kind of go, that used to be me. That ever happened to you? That's a tough feeling, isn't it? I used to be close to them. You can't stay close to everybody forever. I realize that. But there are times in our life we feel that way. We feel our friends are distant, our family's no longer close to us. We, the old job that we like so much is somebody else's job. They're sitting at your desk using your phone, your computer. Somebody else is living in your apartment or your house because you couldn't live there anymore for whatever reason. Those are times where we feel like exiles because we look back and we go, what happened? What happened in my life? And maybe you feel that way with God. Where's the closest? We used to be, I used to be close to God. You know, I, there was this lady who got up and testified once in church, a friend of mine, his name is Rich, and he was preaching this revival at this church, and man, people were just getting so close to Jesus, and this woman got up in church, and she testified, and she said, Brother Rich, I feel so close to God. I'm just on a first-name basis with God. And everybody was, woo, yes. She said, in fact, the other day I was praying, and I said, Gotti, maybe you felt that close to God that you were on a first-name basis with God. Maybe you felt that way, and you're saying, where did the closeness go that I felt that close that I could feel God's presence all the time. Where did his voice go? I used to hear what he had to say. When I would read the word, it would speak to me. Where is that? It's just like any other book to me now. Where are the blessings? I used to feel like I, was, I felt so blessed. Well, I'll tell you what happened. Circumstances happen. And with it comes change, and we feel disoriented, and we feel like an exile. 
Let me just say something to you about that. If you are in that place, God has not left you. Okay? God loves you. So maybe that's why I said that at the beginning. And God has not pushed you away. God has not moved out of your neighborhood. Wherever you went, God has gone with you. Psalm 139 says it, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? So don't be afraid. I didn't give you that scripture. That was a free one. He's looking all over for it in his computer. God's promises. He, if God said, there's no place you can go to get away from my spirit. There's no place that you can go to get away. And this is the psalmist, of course, writing this about how he felt. I'm just going to tell you, that's, turn that one around. That's a promise that God will be with us no matter where we go. And his promises are true. He always keeps his promises. And God's love is just a whole lot more stubborn than anybody else's you've ever dealt with. He just doesn't, you, he doesn't get the message that you don't want him, that you don't want to live for him. He doesn't get that message. He's like, uh-huh, and I still love you. Uh-huh. And I still love you. You see, his love just never, ever stops. It's relentless. He never stops pursuing us because he's our lover. And now, how do we know this for sure? So I'm saying all this stuff, and it sounds good, but how do we absolutely know this for sure? I mean, do, are we just supposed to, like, believe this stuff? Well, the proof is in the past. We need to go back and look at what God is like. We talked about this in the beginning. Remember in the, when we were studying the book of Joel for several weeks? It's talked about the whole thing that Joel was prophesying about was a coming attack on Jerusalem. And he was foretelling this. He was telling it's going to happen where they were going to destroy the city of Jerusalem. Babylon was going to come and destroy the city of Jerusalem and take all the treasures, including all of the artifacts out of the temple that they used for worship that were ordained by God. And they took the people captive, and they put them in work camps. I mean, thousands of people were taken out. And they, they didn't just come one time. They came like three different times and took more people each time. Isn't that incredible? Well, we need more, so let's go. We know where to get them. And they would come, and they were defenseless. There's nothing they could do against Bab Babylon. And then, over a period of time, Cyrus the Great became the ruler of Babylon. Cyrus the Great, okay? Cyrus is not, he is, was not a righteous person at all, okay? He was not a God follower, but God used him to fulfill his word to the Jews that they would return back to their homeland in 70 years. So I said three times they came and got people, and they, they, they stole things. They, they uh, overran the city, tore buildings down, set things on fire. They did that three times and took people back. So take 70 years from the first time and count 70 years, and that's when Cyrus said, we need to send these people back. We need to let them go back to their homeland. That was prophesied that that's how that would go. We talked about that a few weeks ago. So let's go to the book of Ezra, chapter 1, verse 1 through 11. We're actually going to just work through Ezra over the next few weeks. It says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, the king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also put it in writing. So Jeremiah had said, after 70 years of this beatdown, then it would be over and they would return, okay? And Cyrus is the guy. And this is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven. Now, remember, this is, this is not a Jew, okay? It's not a person who was raised or uh, knows all that much about the, the Jewish God. But he says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me. Remember we said last week 
or a week or two ago that sometimes God uses evil people, right? And what does he recognize? How did I get my power? God has appointed me to build a temple for him. So God's going to use this man to rebuild the temple for him at Jerusalem in Judea. Incredible, isn't it? Here's these people that have been beat down. They've been robbed. They've been made slaves. And now he's going to send them back, and he's going to pay for the rebuilding of the temple. Wow. God is incredible, isn't he? Any of his people among you may go to Jerusalem. Anybody. Okay, if you want to go, go. In Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. Verse 4, and in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people, what people? The Babylonians. This sounds a lot like when they left Egypt, doesn't it? So they're captors. They're captors. So in any locality where survivors may now be living, the captors, the people that live in Babylon, are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Oh, my goodness. We're not just going to send them packing. We're not going to say goodbye, good luck. We're going to say go back, and we're going to give you all kinds of goodies to get your life restarted incredible. We're going to try to pay you back for all the years that you have been in bondage here for 70 years. Verse 5, then the family heads of Judea and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Verse 6, all their neighbors assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, with valuable gifts in addition to all the free will offerings. So they did what? Cyrus told him to do. Verse 7, moreover, King Cyrus, this is, the, this is the, the cherry on top right here, guys. This is incredible. King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. So he desecrated the things that used to worship God, and he took them and put them in his unholy temple, guys. You know what that was? That was a statement to say, my God, your God is nothing. Look, I'm going to take the stuff you used to worship God, and we're going to worship my God with it. My heathen God is greater than your God. So it was more than just taking stuff. He could have taken and melted down that stuff. He didn't. He wanted to make a statement over and over to whoever came in worship, look how powerful our God is. And it says in verse 8, Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought by Mithredath, the treasurer, excuse me, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. So he had people who knew the stuff. <clears throat> he had Jews who knew the stuff, okay, who were uh, used to being in the temple and had them take it and make sure it was all there. I want to make sure you get all this and make sure it goes back to where it belongs. Isn't this incredible? Guys, when the chips are down, when you've lost everything, when you've been exiled, when you're in another place and you don't know how you got there, remember God's promises, okay? that he will take care of you. He will take care. He's promised to do this. And verse 9, this was the inventory. So then, you know, it's like we won't go through, read all this, but you can see uh, if he puts up verse 9 and then if he puts up verse 10, you'll see it's telling how many, um, you know, bowls and dishes and pans. Sounds like, you know, a household there. But it was all the stuff that was used in the worship in the temple. What it was in verse 11, it says, in all, there were 5,400 articles of gold and silver. Baby, that's a lot. Okay? And Shezbazar brought all these along with the exiles when they came up from Babylon to Jerusalem. So in Jeremiah chapter 25, Jeremiah foretold this whole scenario. He, told, he said this would happen. He said the Jews would be taken captive for 70 years then they would be released. And then he would punish Babylon 
and wipe this great nation completely off the earth. He would make it, and in his words, Jeremiah said, God would make that prosperous place desolate forever. Try to find Babylon. If Go to Iraq and try to find Babylon now. Where is it? This incredible uh, place with these gardens. I guess it had these tiered gardens in the capital city, and it was like one of the wonders of the world. Now it's a desert, basically. I mean, everything I've seen about Iraq is, you know, why is it Iraq? You know, it's near the Euphrates River. And so God, what God says is going to happen, whether it's good or bad, it's going to happen, isn't it? And then the prophet Isaiah prophesied in, in uh, Isaiah 45, 13. He says, I will raise up Cyrus. He even names him. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness, and I will make all his ways straight, and he will rebuild my city and set my exiles free. So there it is. When God says something, when God gives us a promise, it doesn't matter what your circumstance looks like, how long you're in that circumstance, or what's going on in that circumstance. It doesn't matter because God's Word is God's Word, and it's going to come true because God is in control. He has a plan for us. He works through our circumstances, whether good or bad, to bless us. When God makes promises, they're going to come to pass, period. And even when we don't keep our promises, God keeps his promises because he has a purpose for our life. He wants that purpose done. And what he'll do is he'll take your past and redeem it. What does that mean? Well, all the things that you suffered, all the things, the mistakes you made, all the wrong turns that you made, he's going to work it so that that helps you fulfill his purpose. How in the world can he do that? I can't tell you, but I know he's done it for me. That not one rotten circumstance that I've gone through, and I thought they were wrong turns at the time. I thought that was a huge mistake. Why did I ever do that? Whatever happened? And God has showed me, oh, but you're going, that's going to be used later. Now, he didn't tell me that. I found that out when he used it later. And I went, oh. All right. I could talk about that, but I'm not going to. So I'm sure, I'm sure for 70 years, the people of Israel, they forgot about the promises spoken by Jeremiah. I think probably for the first couple years, you know, they were like, well, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Remember, prophet said 70 years, blah, 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 blah. You know, and then after about five years, you know, and then 10 years, they're like, yeah, whatever, Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. This is never going to end. And, you know, after a while, your circumstances, and then the people that heard it firsthand or the people that started teaching that and believing that and claiming that promise, they die off, something happens to them, and the intensity of, of the message is lost after a while. The impression it makes on us. Guys, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. It may be lost to you, but God doesn't forget his promises to us. You may forget, but he does not. When we get totally surrounded by our situation, God still doesn't. It doesn't distract him one bit. And he allows our, he has allowed the situation you're in, by the way. He's allowed that. If he didn't, it wouldn't happen. And he's going to use it to fulfill his promise in you. God has, for instance, God has promised us a home to be in his family through Jesus Christ. That's a promise that if you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, then eternally you have a home. You have a home of love. You have a home of protection. You have a home of blessing in God's family. That doesn't even, we're not even, that's, called, that's the abundant life right now. Now, we know there's a home that we're going to go to one day, whether we die or it's when he comes again. But we have a home right now. We have a home with each other. 
You mean something to me whether you know it or not, far beyond just an acquaintance. You've been there for me, and I've tried to be there for you. That begins a bond that we have, doesn't it? We have a bond through Jesus Christ as well because of what he's done for us. We all share that. I used to be in Florida for many years, but I still followed the Cleveland Browns for some sick reason, and I was a, I was a fan. And they had people down there called the Browns backers, and I found out they're everywhere. They're in Saudi Arabia, for heaven's sakes, and they're the Browns backers. They're everywhere, and they all get together, and they watch Browns games together. Well, I guess... And, and the funny thing is, you would see people wearing Cleveland, you know, colors or jerseys or what, and it'd be like, you didn't even know this person. You'd go, dude, Bernie Kosar, yes, wah, you know? And it'd be like, you'd be at the mall, and it was just like, you know, you knew them. You were like brothers and sisters all of a sudden, you know? And you'd be talking about the game last week, ah, bah, and just, you know, doing the the dog thing. We would be going, hoo, 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 and like all oh, the whole thing. We don't even know. And then I'd walk away going, I don't even Get, I don't even know their names. And we just had, like, you know, Holy Church in the mall, you know, over the Browns. <sighs> but you see, we have this common thing that's even stronger than sports. It's stronger than family ties. It's stronger than what college you went to, I, you know. It's the family of God bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, you see. And that's what, and so sometimes I'll be in a store and I'll, go, I'll think, I think that's a Christian right there. There's just something about that, you know. And every now and then we'll even ask. We'll go, are you a follower of Christ? Yes, I am. <laughs> and it's like, oh, here we go. Ooh, 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 you know. We begin, oh, oh. no, we don't do that, but. But something happens. Something happens. There's this, this thing that we have that binds us together. That's what I call our spiritual home. That's what I call having a home, isn't it? It's a place, but it's not tangible. It's not tangible, but it's something that binds us together. And it's time to reclaim your home. It's time to come back to your first love. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider now how far you've fallen and repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, these are the words of an angel that were speaking to the church at Ephesus, the Ephesians saying that their love had grown cold, okay? Could this be what God is speaking to you and me? I mean, we like church, and we, lo we love Jesus, and we love the things at church. If you've been raised in church, especially, you feel like it's an essential part of your life. But where is your love life with Jesus right now? Where is your love life with God? How important is that compared to everything else in your life? Could this be what God is saying to you and me? Return to your first love. Reclaim your home. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. Every time... It was the word all, which is 100%. Are we, so there, there's your meter right there. Am I loving God with all my heart, with all my soul? Does it supersede every other thing in my life that I'm passionate about? With all my mind? Do I get lost in worrying and thinking about other things? And God's not even a part of that. With all my strength? You know, every now and then I just get homesick for Florida, especially in February. 
But no, seriously, I, there's just times I start thinking, I lived there a long time, and I, I, miss, I miss Ocala, Florida. It's, you know, it's just this little town. It's not huge, but it's where my kids were born, and they grew up, and there's just times, you know, if you're not living where you, what you call home, you know what I'm talking about, you know. Maybe you came from the south and now you're in the north. You know, maybe you're in the, uh, the south and you came from the north and, or whatever. If you've been transplanted in your life, you know what I'm talking about. It's like no matter how things maybe went for you, there's still some fond memories there. You know what I'm saying? Things that you miss. And there's times I just want to go back, and I did a couple years ago. I went back and took a vacation down there because I just wanted to immerse myself in that place and the people. I wanted to see them, and I just wanted all that to be real, not a dream again. The culture, everything. And talking about it and remembering just wasn't enough. It's a part of me forever, okay? It's a part of my life forever and will always tug at me. And you see, I really believe that, spiritually speaking, that's the same thing that God, when we begin to drift in our strength, our mind, our soul, our spirit, and we begin to drift in any of those areas, and we begin to stiff-arm God in any of those areas, and we say, I can make, I can do this on my own, I really believe what happens is we begin to want to, Im there's something that begins to draw us back to God. And I believe it's time for us to reclaim our home. And we're going to be talking about this in the weeks to come. Return to your first love. Immerse yourself in his presence. Do you remember what that, what that was like once before? Do you remember when that was the primary thing in your life? Do you remember when you felt like you were unstoppable because of how you felt about God and the confidence that you had in his, in his presence in your life and how different you felt now than before you accepted Christ? But the question is, has other things crowded out your passion for God? Have you relocated your passions to some other things? Has the world that you've lived in disillusioned you so badly because of the way people are and the way circumstances are right now that you've lost your vision for the love of God? And it, your love has grown cold, maybe. It happens. Can I tell you that? That this happens? It happens to me? I believe it can happen to each one of us. It's time to reclaim your home Return to your first love. Immerse yourself in his presence. And the longer we're away, the more distant, more unreal it seems. And what, what happens is just like these people that lived in Babylon, after a while, hopelessness sets in. And you think, well, that's when I was a new Christian. And you know what? You grow up and you mature. And, you know, you put away childish things. I don't ever want to put away that with God. That's nonsense. Do you know what that's nonsense? I don't believe that. I believe we can be passionate and have a fiery passion for God throughout our entire life. It's something, though, that we have to maintain. It's something that we have to make sure that we keep our eye on. And even when we don't, the Holy Spirit speaks to us, but sometimes we go, ah, I'm busy. Uh, I got, uh, you know, I got other things. I don't have time for that. I can't think about that right now. What would I have to give up for that? And we need to go back to Joel 2. God makes a promise that if we return to him, if we humble ourselves, we studied this, if we humble ourselves in prayer and fasting, he says in verse 25, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. So I don't care what has happened to your life, what you've lost in your life, it doesn't matter. God said, if you return to me, humble yourself in prayer and fasting, 
I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locusts, the young locusts, and the other locusts, okay? And the locusts swarm. My great army that I sent among you. Because in Joel, God says, if you don't repent, there's going to be wave after wave of things that happens to the Israelites, and it's going to destroy them down to a nub, and it did. He said, but if you repent and you fast, then I'll send a great spiritual revival. That's what I need. That might be what you need in your life is a great spiritual revival. Now, we can apply all this to the United States or whatever country that you live in. You could apply these things on a more global basis. Yes, you can, because that was about the, the Israelites. But I want you to apply this to you. Where are you? What is God speaking to you? I'm here to tell you, everything the enemy has stolen from you, everything that you've squandered, been foolish with, because we all have done that, Everything, God wants to restore it to you. Do you hear that? But we have to come back to him, and we have to humble ourselves. And the great way to do that is through fasting and prayer. You know, I think it was Mary telling us about our fasting and prayer on Tuesday, and we'd love you to join us on Tuesdays, fasting and prayer here at 7 o'clock. If you can't do that, you can even join us by Zoom if you ask for the link. But I don't want somebody just going through the motions and saying, well, I got that out of the way. Where's my blessing? Okay. The purpose of that is to humble ourselves and to remind us how much we need God. I need God more than what? What is it that's so important to you? Or what is it that you've lost that you're still bitter about? Or whatever, what is it that you, you could put in there? I need God more than. So how do we, how do we reclaim our home? See, the cool thing is in Ezra here in verse 4, God shows what he does if you make up your mind. I'm coming home, God. I'm coming back to you. He says, I'll provide everything you need to come back and worship me. Doesn't it? That's what it says. He says, I'll provide. They needed silver, gold, livestock, food, provisions. They needed all that to get back to their homeland. And God said, I'll make sure you have what you need to come back to me. So all you have to do today is say, that's what I want to do, God. I want to, I want to come back home. I want to reclaim my home in you. I want that closeness. And I don't know what it's going to cost me, but that's what I want more than anything. And guess what? I believe God will do for you just what he did for the Israelites. He'll give you what you need to get there. I don't know what you need to get there. I don't know why you haven't gotten there yet. Something's kept you. But I'm going to tell you, God won't let anything stand in the way of you coming back to him. Isn't that a beautiful thought? He told them, the 70 years is up. It's time to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. He was restoring worship in their lives again. Where is worship in your life? Is it just songs you play on your phone or on your, in your car? Or do you have a life of worship, of sacrifice? of making God the center of every single thing in your life. God wants to restore that kind of worship. It's time to restore your worship. And God's saying it's time to leave your exile. Listen, I'm not leaving us followers of Christ out of this. We drift away. We stiff arm God. And God is saying it's time to leave that. Come back to me. It's time to come home. Just like Israel, I will give you what you need to reclaim your home. Nothing should stand in the way. You can worship God again. You can thank him again. You can cry out to God again. You can have those, you can immerse yourselves in God again. Absolutely. And God wants to restore that place of worship in your life again. So if it's 
kind of been going through the motions, kind of dry and I'm just doing this because I'm supposed to do it. God says it could be a lot better than that. Your life could be a lot more exciting if you'll worship me, if you'll follow me, if you'll give me everything. Come back. Come back home. Let's pray. Father God, sometimes we just need to go back home. We need to begin again. And we need to return to you. And we need to experience the freshness, the simplicity, the fullness of your love that we once had in our lives. And really, that's what we desire. And we've just, we've messed everything up. We've made it so complicated. We've totally clouded our image of you with the way we live our lives sometimes. And I just ask God, bring us all back home. We reclaim our home in you today, Father. We reclaim that. Right now, God, I pray that you would speak to some people who are just, they're just thinking about this right now. They're teetering on the edge of a decision. God, Holy Spirit, speak to them and give them the courage to just make the first step towards you. Whether, it's, whether this is a follower of Christ or somebody who's seeking you, God, I pray, God, the Holy Spirit will rise up with them and show them your infinite love for them. Forgive us, God. We ask for your forgiveness today for drifting away from stiff-arming you, but we're so thankful that you love us the way that you love us, that you never stop loving us, you never stop pursuing us, you always come after us. You love us, God, forever. You love us, God, forever, and we love you. Now, God, we, we close this part of the service and ask that you would speak to each and every heart today and draw us home to you. Help us to reclaim our home. We ask in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here, and we appreciate all those who have joined us through Facebook Live and through YouTube and other ways. And we encourage you to like these videos or share them with your friends. If it's, uh, if it's meant something to you, then we'd appreciate you sharing that as well. And thank you, and God bless you.